The child rips at the package. And this package is especially difficult, not only as it wrapped up, but the box is taped up. The child knows it, it has to, the child knows that he or she has to look really happy because daddy is leaning in. This is an important gift for dad, if not for the child. Finally, after the tape is ripped away, the box is open and the child realizes that this is a good present. In fact, most of the child's friends want this very thing that the child now has. But if you were to pull the child aside and say, what is it that you really want for Christmas? The child would tell you, they want daddy. A few less late nights at the office, a few less Saturdays headed into work, a few more afternoons playing uh, ball or sipping tea at little girls' tea parties. What I really want is daddy. The young husband holds a small package out to his young wife at the very exclusive restaurant where they have chosen to eat that night. Because of work, he had to shop way too late on Christmas Eve, and he spent way more money than they had agreed to spend. He is hoping that this gift will make up for all of the times that work called him away, about when a business trip wrecked a family trip, about all the times during the previous year that he had promised to be there, but then wasn't. He's hoping that it's what is in that box will make up for all of the times of absence. Uh, but if you were to ask her, she would tell you, what I really want for Christmas is him. So we come together and we sing the carols about a baby born a long time ago in a little bitty village of Bethlehem. And how grateful we are that Jesus came then and there what we'd really like to hear is that he is here Amen. now. Amen. So hear the promise of Emmanuel as it is given to the prophet Isaiah in the seventh chapter of his book. Stand with me as we begin there, then we'll read from the first chapter of Matthew's gospel. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God, from the depths of Sheol to the heights of heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. And Isaiah said, listen house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and have a son and name him Emmanuel. And by the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating butter and honey. Before the boy knows how to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. See how this prophecy came to fulfillment in the first chapter of Matthew, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered that that before they came together, she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what the, was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he didn't know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and he, Joseph, named him Jesus. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Amen. Let's pray together.
we pray the ancient promise of Emmanuel will become the, God, the, the reality for us today. The promise of Emmanuel will become the truth of God with us. We pray this in your name. Amen. How many of you have ever had the fantasy of what you would ask God if God asked you what kind of sign do you want? How many of us have said, this is, this is what I need from God. I need some kind of sign, some kind of verification, some kind of little recognition. You know, Elijah had the fire come from heaven and burn up everything on the top of the mountain. How many of you would be satisfied if a candle lit? What would you ask for? Would you ask for all the money in, in the world? If God said, give me a sign, I'd ask for all the money in the world. Would that help? Uh, this is past week, we celebrated the, uh, in, in the press the, uh, the, one of the largest uh, lottery awards ever. And two or very lucky people, or so they say, won this lottery. And now we want to know who they are. We want to know how their life is going to change. Are they going to quit work? Are they going to stay working? Are they going to buy a new house? Are they going to buy their cousin a house? Are they going to buy us a house? With that much money, you can spread it around a little bit, right? No, but we have now followed the lottery long enough. We have enough stories of people who won the lottery only to see their lives crumble under the pressure of not knowing what to do with all of that money. Now you're thinking, oh Lord, give me the chance <laughs> just to prove to you Would it help? Not really. Because the things that you and I want to fix can't be fixed with cash, can they? Amen. Would you ask for something? Oh, I don't know. Something kind of spectacular like the earth spinning backwards? <laughs> Would you like to be there on the news and go, hey, yeah, I'm the guy that told God, spin it the other way. Just for laughs. What would you ask for? <laughs> Don't you have this kind of feeling that if you would ask for something, God would go, really, that's all? I've given you the opportunity to ask for everything, and that's all you want? We would be kind of embarrassed to confess to God how small our prayers really are. But you know what makes us mad about this story? Ahaz was a lousy king. That's what makes us mad. He didn't deserve a sign. After all, we have this kind of understanding, don't we? If you're really, really good, you get Jesus points. And once you get enough Jesus points, you can cash them in for a sign. Good people get signs. Not this guy. This guy offered his son as a sacrifice to a pagan god. Read it. It's in, it's in 2 Kings chapter 16 where it says he made his son pass through the fire. That's what it meant. He offered his own son as a sacrifice to a pagan god. He built places for pagan gods to be worshipped. And when the battle is about to take place that Isaiah is talking to Ahaz about, Ahaz does not trust in God. He trusts in Assyria, a pagan kingdom, and trusts the chariots and the soldiers of Assyria to protect him, not God, and becomes a vassal state of Assyria to the point that he takes out uh, of the temple, all the things used to worship God, and he uses them to worship the pagan gods of Assyria. This guy is a really, really bad king. And he gets that kind of sentence at the end in the kings when they're summing up their, their, their rule. You have this one sentence that says, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he gets a sign. Really? Really? Is that fair? Ahaz was a loser of a king. And here Isaiah is, right after Isaiah's call in chapter 6, he's told to go tell Ahaz this good news. And so he tells Ahaz, God says, do not be afraid. Stand in your faith, because if you don't stand in your faith, you will not stand at all. And when Ahaz has no faith, God says, tell him, I'll give him a sign. Ahaz goes, far be it from me 
to tell God what to do. Now, doesn't that sound like a great answer? It was a coward's answer. Because we have other times where people, where, where people were asked of God, what do you want? And they were able to say, not Ahaz, because he didn't want to get checkmated by God. You, you know, sometimes we ask for something and then realize we wouldn't have asked for that had we known what it was when we asked for it. That's when you get some great insights by great theologians uh, by, uh, like Garth Brooks, <laughs> who, who has a wonderful song called Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. It's about all the girls he wanted to date in high school. Then he goes back to his high school reunion some years later and he says, thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> See, this is something I wouldn't have asked for if I'd known what I was asking for when I asked for it. Or like Merlin in the story of Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table who asked the gods to let him live forever and they granted him that wish. But he forgot to ask for eternal youth. So he lived dying the whole time. See, sometimes what we ask for isn't good news at all. So Ahaz doesn't want to get caught in that. Nope. I'll just take whatever God sends me. And Isaiah says, okay, God's going to send you a sign. Here it is, a baby. Ahaz must have been sitting on his throne going, really? A baby? <laughs> I need chariots. I need soldiers. I've got two kings coming after me who want me dead. I need somebody bigger than a baby. Isaiah kept on. Isaiah, Ahaz, you're not paying attention. For the name of the baby is God with us. According to Romans 8, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against you. And when we pe preached through this passage a couple of weeks ago, when we went through the great book of Romans, I told you the story of, 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 of recess. Y'all remember, little school lets you out, and so you're going to play some sports at recess, or playing in your neighborhood. And you know, the two best athletes always chose the teams, right? And so, it, the only thing you had to do to be sure you were going to win is make sure that the right captain chose you. Okay? Now, on my street, that captain was Darlene Hill. <laughs> Say what you want to, but Darlene was faster, stronger, better player. She played basketball better than we did. She played baseball better than we did. She was fast. She was football better than we did. So, if you wanted to win, the only thing you had to do was make sure Darlene chose you. Because it didn't matter who was on the other team. It didn't matter how good you were or how bad you were. If Darlene was on your team, you are going to win. So listen, this good news of Emmanuel is not who is on the outside of the gates, not whose armies have chosen up, who have, uh, who have joined up against you. The good news is, is that God is for you. It doesn't matter who's against you. If God has chosen you, you're going to win, not because of any talent you bring to it, but because of who the captain is. Amen. Now, that's what Ahaz heard from Isaiah. God keeps his promises to Abraham and to Moses and to David and all the rest, not that you deserve it, but that God keeps his promises. Ahaz, if you believe, sorry king that you are, I'll still keep my promises. I'm here. Joseph knew a lot about keeping promises. He was a man who kept promises. He was a righteous man. That means when you shook the hand of Joseph, you had a deal. His, his word and his bond were the same. We always confuse righteous with right. And so we always want to be people with right answers. So we study theological trivia. And we want to be sure that somebody asks us some obscure question. We always have the right answer. Right is not the same as righteous. Righteous is living the way God wants you to live despite the circumstances. Now, Joseph was a righteous man. He lived the way God wanted him to live despite the circumstances. And he never, ever thought 
that these would be the circumstances. He had kept his promise to Mary, but Mary hadn't kept his promise to him. And the story she was bringing about a baby and the Holy Spirit and an angel named Gabriel who told her about what would happen. He loved her, he did. He didn't want to hurt her, he didn't want to embarrass her, but this was just a little too much even for Joseph. So Joseph decides that I'll divorce her, but I'll do it very quietly. I don't want to humiliate her. We'll just take care of this and I'll move on with my life. And so he goes home to sleep on it. Maybe things will be different in the morning. Maybe I'll have a clearer understanding. And in the middle of his, uh, of his sleep, he has a dream. And in the dream, the angel says, Mary's telling you the truth. Don't be afraid. Do you remember the scriptures? Well, of course he remembered the scriptures. He was a man of the Bible. More than likely, all of the scripture that Jesus quoted from memory, Joseph would have taught him. That was the husband's, the father's role in the son's life. He would have taught Jesus those memory verses. Of course Joseph knew this story of Isaiah and Ahaz. Do you remember the story of the baby? Yeah. What was the baby's name? Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. The promise made to Ahaz is now being kept through Mary and you. God is here. Emmanuel. God is here. Emmanuel. And that's really what we want to know, isn't it? Not so much that we want life easier. We, we, we don't want life fixed. We just want to know we're not in this by ourselves. We don't mind life being hard. Uh, Meshach, Sadrach, and Abednego, they, they proved that for us, didn't they? Remember the story? It's in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a great king, and he has uh, taken uh, refugees from uh, exiles from Jerusalem, and he's brought them to Babylon to serve him. Daniel and his friends are ten times better than anybody else. And so Nebuchadnezzar brings them especially close, and he, like a lot of good rulers, begins to believe his own press. He begins, to be, he begins to believe that he's really as good as everybody says he is. And he says, you know what this town needs is a big statue of me. And so he builds a big statue of me and says, you know, I'm going to blow the horn. And when I blow the horn, everybody should fall down and worship this big statue of me. And so Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego said, you can blow that horn all you want to, but we're not falling down. Nebuchadnezzar says, don't you know I can take your life or give it to you? And the three of them say, we don't care. We serve the one true living God who has the power to deliver us, but even if He doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow down. Now, some of you have heard that if you stand up to a bully that they're afraid of you just like you're afraid of them, that they will not hit you. Yes, they will. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was a bully. The three of them stood up, and guess what? He threw them in the fiery furnace, just like he said he would. Now, this must have been one more fiery furnace because it had a viewing platform. And so he went to the viewing platform so he could see the three die in agonizing pain. But what he sees is three guys walking around with a fourth friend. How many people did we throw in there? The king shouts out. They shout back, three, but there's four in here. There's four, we threw three in, there's four in there. There was another person waiting on them. You see, it's not that hell is hot that makes hell bad. What makes hell bad is that God isn't there. Amen. Doesn't matter about the details. It's the absence of God that makes it unbearable. Amen. We don't mind that it is hot, or that the fiery furnace is lit up. We just don't want to be in there by ourselves. So how many of us have been thinking, you know, Mike, if I knew that Jesus was here, I would be so much braver. 
I, I wouldn't be afraid at all if I just knew that Jesus was here. Really? Bluff called. Some of you are saying, I would fight harder for my marriage if I just knew I wasn't by myself. Bluff called. Some of you were saying, you know, I would, I would give up so quickly on my child if I knew that Jesus would just hang in there with me. I, I, I just don't have the strength sometimes to do it by myself if I just knew he were here. Bluff called. Oh, I would tell everybody, Mike, I wouldn't waste an opportunity to tell people about Jesus and who he is and what he's done and what a difference he makes in my life if I just knew he was with me. Bluff called. All the things you promised you would do if he were just here. You can do because he is. Amen. Amen. Now, I know you heard all of the news this past week, and you're thinking, we got some real big problems, Mike. What in the world are we going to do with a baby? <laughs> well, how much God do you need? What situation do you have? What circumstance are you in where you would say, oh, Jesus is just not enough God? Bluff called. He didn't say it would be easy. He didn't say it wouldn't hurt. He didn't say we wouldn't have enemies. Or that people wouldn't hunt us. Or that people wouldn't hate us. He said, you'll never be by yourself. Amen. Emmanuel. God with us. Bluff called.